isn't in that hilarious? And I'm really glad because this is going to be kind of a serious message, but I thought they were fantastic. So it's so good to worship together again online. We welcome you too. And I have had the opportunity to travel um, around the world, different places, and the freedom that we have to gather unhindered is amazing. And I'm always super humbled and super grateful that we can freely gather. We can freely access our services online. And so I'm very, very thankful for that. Such an amazing opportunity. And really pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who don't have that. Yes. Well, I have a question for you. Have you ever been trying to make something or perhaps assemble like new furniture from Ikea or you know, a toy backyard playset for your kids and then gotten so frustrated because the instructions are so long and so complicated, they don't make sense, you can't find all the pieces, okay, right? Most of us have had that experience. Well, I am a learning disabilities teacher and I've self-diagnosed myself as having a learning disability because I absolutely can, like, I get dizzy reading instructions. And this even happens when I'm doing something like following a recipe, particularly if it's long and compli complicated, and then, as often happens, I don't have the ingredients. And so that I just kind of end up doing it my own way rather than following the instructions. So I found this interesting little poem the other day when I was attempting to make something, and it said this, I didn't have potatoes, so I substituted rice. I didn't have paprika, I mean, I used another spice. I didn't have tomato sauce, I used tomato paste. Not half a can, a whole one. I don't believe in waste. A friend gave me this recipe. She said, you couldn't beat it. There must be something wrong with her. I couldn't even eat it. <laughs> hmm. You mean because I didn't follow the right way, maybe? <laughs> you know? oh, this is kind of a joke in our family because everybody kind of knows about my recipe disability. And um, Hap, my husband, you know, we'll, everyone will be seated at the table, you know, be a big dinner, or maybe we're eating my Italian beef, or I make a really good chocolate cake, and sure enough, they'll go, die. <clears throat> did, did you change the way you made this? I'm like, no, <laughs> I mean, although I might have, who knows, anyway. The bottom line is, no shortcuts, no substitutions, do it the right way. Well, many are looking for a way, not just to cook right? A way to do life, a way out of the craziness of the world, a way out of misery, a, a way to flourish. We're looking for a way. And in our series, Jesus, the way, the truth, the life, we're looking at today, I am the way, where he said, I am the way. And interestingly, he did not say, I am a way. He said, I am the way. Okay. And so we, we see right away that the way is not a path. You know, it's not a program. The way is a person, the person of Jesus. And the way is not a religion. The way is a relationship with the person of Jesus. So my question, um, as we dive in today, is Jesus the only way? Now, last week, Julie did an amazing job of introducing this series, Who is Jesus? And we discovered he is the God-man who made it possible now for us to be actual partakers of the divine nature, which is just stunning. And today, we're going to say, okay, so is he the only way, like, for that to happen, or like now, or forever? Let me just do a, a little aside here, too. I know many of you here are young in, in this service and possibly on, online, and you don't necessarily think about the afterlife, right? When you get to be my age and you've buried two parents in the last few years, you're like, what do I actually believe? Like, actually, what does happen to me after I die? And so that's part of the issue that we're going to look at briefly today as we see Jesus is the way to life, but not just life now, but forever. Okay, now these are serious questions. I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit. He's such a good teacher. 
You are Holy Spirit. Where would we be without you? Did you know the Bible is frankly confusing sometimes? Our lives are confusing. We invite you to sort out things today in our hearts, our minds, our lives. Will you, will you illuminate Jesus to us again? Will you teach us the truth? Will you overcome our obstacles? We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Just bring your understanding of the word. Bring your revelation of our Lord Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, our anchor text for this series is found in the Gospel of John. And it was on the occasion when Jesus was giving important instructions to his disciples. He was about to go to the cross. And he made this statement found in John 14, 6. And this is from the ESV version. It will be on the screens for you too. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's a bold and quite exclusive statement, right? To say Jesus is the way, not a way, the only way. It's, you know, it's very controversial. It's actually very confusing. It's, yeah, it's not very popular in our culture because, as most of you know, we live in a very pluralistic culture, which is good in many ways. Plural just means many you know, the plural, and it just means there's a lot of different ways to do things, whether it's the way you believe, the way you do life, the way you raise your kids, the way you cook, whatever. We live in a very pluralistic culture. And so when we say Jesus is the only way, it sounds like too exclusive, too bigoted, too intolerant. And unfortunately, that's often the way it's been shared with people. And I'm sorry for that. Because actually, it's time for us to have some awesome dialogue, good conversations with compassion, okay, and to hear what people are saying, because this is an extremely important topic, okay? But most of you would know, if you've had any of these discussions with people, that it can come across as bad news, right? Not good news. And so, are there many ways to do life? aren't always legitimate? Is Jesus the only way? Or does every way lead to what? God? Afterlife? You know, it's interesting. Many people like to say, well, all paths lead to God. If you are a devout practicing Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, hopefully Christian, you do not agree that all paths lead to God. See, every faith has very specific way of life, a very specific destination, as does Christianity. So generally the people saying, well, don't all paths lead to God, are generally people that don't embrace a specific religious faith, at least in its, you know, truth. Because, you know, they're just leaving their options open, they want to be loving and they want to be tolerant, and so, yeah, don't always lead to God. Even people who embrace more, say, a scientific or rationalistic uh, view, which is very popular in our culture, or maybe you're atheistic, you don't believe in God, you're not actually, you don't believe there's an afterlife. So in many ways, this question, Jesus is the only way, isn't relevant. Although Jesus is the only way has a lot to do with life right here, because he says nobody comes to the Father. Nobody actually comes into relationship with the amazing Father God, except through Jesus. So, Okay, so is Jesus one of just many ways? Now, I'm also aware in our culture that there's a growing group called the nuns. And when they, uh, you know, survey people, like, well, what kind of religious faith do you have? And they go, none. They have none. But the truth is, everybody has a way. In our culture, specifically, usually, it's your own way. It's your own way. You're in control. You're your own God. You know, that's a choice. Like, we have a ton of freedom. <laughs> Sometimes I go, God, that's the problem. We have too much freedom, you know. No, we have freedom to choose the way we want to go. Now, I'm not going to convince you um, with my words. You can look up lots of scriptures, and we'll look at scriptures today. But I'm trusting, first of all, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and he'll take over where 
I fail, but I also want, I hope that my way of life reflects that Jesus is the way, is a good choice. I, I pray that the way I treat people, the way I've lived my life, raised my family, interact with my neighbors, I pray that my way of life shows you Jesus is not only the best way, he is really the only way to have a flourishing life. I do. Okay, let's just address that whole question. Why is Jesus the way, okay? Why? Well, again, I could just say, well, it says so in the Bible. But, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, that's fine. But a lot of people don't believe the Bible. They don't, you know, trust the Bible. Okay, so I start having a conversation with uh, Jesus, I said, look, I'm going to be teaching on this. I mean, obviously, I believe this. I've lived it, you know, since 1971. You know, I've lived this a long time. But uh, Jesus, why, why is this such good news? Because I want to have those conversations, and I'm having them increasingly with people, um, you know, about Jesus. And I said, it just sounds so exclusive. And if there's one word that describes the American culture right now, what is it? Inclusive, right? Like we are inclusive. And that has a lot of good things about it, okay? But so I said, I just, Lord, help me here. He goes, well, first of all, you need to know there is no more inclusive way than Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus <laughs> is the God-man who said, whosoever can come. All are welcome. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your gender, your economic status. It doesn't, it doesn't matter smart, not so smart. It doesn't matter. None of it matters. Jesus said, all who are thirsty may come. Wow. All. Wow. It doesn't matter your sinfulness. It doesn't matter your goodness. <laughs> All may come. Now we have to make that choice. His, the invitation is out there. You can receive it or not, right? Or you can decline. But Jesus is the most inclusive way in the universe. And I'll talk a little bit more about a couple other ways later, briefly. Uh, and there might be some that are more inclusive than Jesus, but he's very inclusive. And he said so beautifully in Romans, he said, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, rescued now and forever. All who call. Now, Jesus loves and invites every person. And I want you to know, <laughs> this was shocking news to me. Because I was a white, middle class, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, religious, holier than thou, but I don't want anything to do with Jesus <laughs> for, you know, a long 20-some years of my life. But how incredible that in September of 1971, sitting on my sofa at 405 North Matthews, which is now the Beckman Institute, I obviously wasn't sitting there, I was sitting in an apartment, I'm reading a book, just a historical fiction, and they're telling a story of a Quaker woman named Alice, and suddenly I find myself weeping and saying, oh, I want to know Jesus like Alice. I don't know what your questions are. I don't know where you are on your journey. I want you to know Jesus is coming for you. And he's coming for you in love. He is. He's coming for you in love. He's an amazing, inclusive Savior because I had no intention. As a matter of fact, my husband, Happy, and I had made a pact. When we got married, we were both party people at the University of Illinois. We said we want nothing to do with God or church. See, the problem is, I'd never met Jesus. Oh, I'd known religion, right? Yeah, I'd known, and I'd known as stifling church, but I'd never met Jesus. <laughs> He's the most inclusive. All who call, thank you, Jesus. So humbling to know. You're so inclusive. I'm going to tell you the story of my friend Les, okay? So Les is a friend of Happy and mine. And uh, he sh stayed in our home and actually shared the story in person. 
which I, I think adds authenticity, right? Okay, it's not just some story I got off the internet, okay? This is Les, a man that we know. Very high-powered businessman, extremely brilliant, worked for some think tank, and uh, like really wanted nothing to do with God. Who needed God? He had his work. He had his mind. He had money. All of which he was pursuing, and he was doing just fine, thank you very much, until he wasn't. You see, all of that, and I can tell you, people say over and over again, oh, I'm fine. Oh, yeah, this is awesome. I love the life I'm leading. Party, bad choices. Yeah, no. At some point, you're going to have to face the truth. You're not loving the life you're leading. And you know what? For less, it was a bleeding ulcer. A bleeding ulcer. He finds himself on the floor of his bathroom one day. He had stumbled in from work, and he's in incredible pain. And suddenly his spirit leaves his body, it goes up, and it's on, hovering over him on the ceiling. And he, he's seeing this, and he's, he's like, at that point, I realized I was going down a long, dark tunnel, and I was consumed with fear. I go, oh my goodness, this is like a near-death experience. I've read about this, but I've never met somebody who had it. He said, yes, so I'm, I'm consumed with fear, and he said, I knew, these are his words, not mine, I was going to hell. We won't debate the existence of that right now. Okay, so there he was. He knew he was dying. And he said, I cried out, Jesus, save me. And then he said, I, I know I've had chances to follow you. I, I want to follow you now, now, forever. And immediately, he said, he started moving towards a bright, golden light, fear left. And he said, I knew Jesus had rescued me. Jesus had saved me. His wife finds him on the floor of the bathroom, rushes him to the hospital, or they called 911, I can't remember. But he had lost 40% of his blood, had to receive transfusions. That's not the only transfusion he received. He received brand new life from Jesus. He said, the workaholic lifestyle, over. The alcoholic life, some of you need to hear this, over. Jesus is his Lord. He called on the name of the Lord. Jesus not only rescued him as he encountered the amazing love of Jesus, he's experienced total transformation in his work, in his family, in his health. Wow. Jesus is the most inclusive Savior. Well, he did have to choose, didn't he? See, I believe when people say, well, what about all the people around the world who've never heard? See, I truly believe our God is so merciful and so loving that there's always an opportunity where you can call out Jesus. Whether you've never heard of him, whether you've never read the Bible, I believe that, that you, everyone will have an opportunity. But you have to humble yourself. You do. And that's the hardest thing, isn't it? Because we're so in control of our own lives. We so want our own way, not his way. Most inclusive Savior ever. I said, okay, Lord, great. But what about, yeah, other faiths actually are pretty inclusive. And I've done a little bit of study, and there's lots of nuances to all of them. Well, the Holy Spirit continued. He said, no, Di. This isn't just the fact that Jesus is inclusive isn't the whole part of the good news. You see, the really good news is Jesus is the most exclusive. I'm like, hey, disconnect. I just, I'm in this conversation with you, and I said, that's what causes people to be mad. Like, that's what causes people to shut down. He goes, oh, no, no, that's because they're using the word exclusive in a different sense. I'm like, okay. No, Jesus is not exclusive in that he excludes anyone. Jesus is not exclusive in that he's like nitpicky, selective, in, out. That's not, he goes, or that he's harsh. Or, no, that's not at all. He says, no, no, no. He is exclusive, unlike all other ways, in that Jesus excludes all of our bad deeds as a hindrance to eternal life. And Jesus excludes all of our good deeds as a prerequisite 
for eternal life. Why? Because it's his work, not ours. Jesus is the way. Now, we can clap at that. We can be excited about that. Why do you think the downtrodden, the poor, the hurting, the women, the demonized were so attracted to Jesus? None of that disqualified them. None of it. They didn't have to be good enough, and they didn't have to do enough good. They did not have to be good enough or do enough good. Why? Because our Savior is the good one, and he did it all for us. It's, it's totally astounding. He alone is the way. The way is a person, not a path. And we have a choice to believe in him, to trust him, and I know. I mean, it's actually very humbling. And it should never be something that we wear on our chest like, man, Anna, boo, boo, my way's better than your way. It's like, come. This amazing Savior, but it's a stumbling block. You know, I did, like I said, just a little bit of research. It was interesting um, to look at a couple other faiths, like Islam and uh, Buddhism and Hinduism. And I know lots of variety in these. But what I found astounding, almost to the T, every one, the mantra is, be good enough, do enough good. And they all end up in different places. Like, if you are a practicing Muslim, you have to adhere, you have to do enough good of the five pillars of faith, prayer, fasting, proclamation, charity. You have to do enough good because on judgment day, you will stand before the judge and he will have the scale and he will put good deeds here and bad deeds here. And guess what? If bad outweighs the good, I don't know where you go. I mean, and it's a very simplistic description. And there's some amazing Muslim people, amazing they are so much more dedicated than many of us. Well, take a Buddhist. The basic view in Buddhism is all of life is suffering. Golly, who wants to embrace that? But, you know, all of life is suffering. And so where does suffering come from? Well, it comes from desire. See, you want the wrong things. You want too much. So you have to do enough good. You have to meditate enough, do enough spiritual work, enough physical work to rid yourself of desire. And then finally what? You get absorbed into nirvana, enlightenment. See, that's a different destination than a believer. It's a different destination even from Muslims. They believe in heaven, but it's like a seven-level heaven. Or take Hindu. Most of you would know this. Again, with all due respect for all faiths, I'm just saying they, you can choose. They have that will. Life, death, reincarnation, all based on karma. What you, what you sow, you reap. Do enough good, good. Do bad, bad. You want to get off that wheel. You want to be good enough and do enough good. You get off that wheel and what? Become one with creation. See, our God... Jesus died our death so that one day we can resurrect. <laughs> we can have a brand new body. And we can actually live forever in a glorious place, which I personally believe is going to be renewed here on earth, but that's another story. Now, that doesn't make us better. It should make us humble and eager to share with people that Jesus is the most inclusive. He's the most exclusive. He excludes all the bad. He excludes all the good. As a matter of fact, I love how the Apostle Paul, he does such a great job in the scriptures. And he's writing to his disciple Titus. And he says, this is in Titus 3. He says, once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled. Folks, a lot of people are deceived right now and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Isn't that our culture? Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. Doesn't that sound like it was written in 2021? Wow, it was written in 60 AD. Okay, that's who we all were, hopefully no more. But it's hard to admit for some. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. God our Savior, the way. What did he do? Out of kindness 
and love. <laughs> Whoa, he rescued us. Not because of the righteous good things we've done. Not at all, but because of his mercy. And he doesn't just leave us there. Okay, you're rescued now. Try to live life the best you can. He goes, no, 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 I'm going to make you brand new. I'm going to give you a new birth. I'm going to make you partakers of the divine nature. And then I'm going to fill you with my very own spirit. And <laughs> you are going to have a flourishing life now and forever. I didn't say you won't suffer. I didn't say you won't be disappointed. But I did say, oh, exactly what he said. He generously poured out the spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior because of his grace. That means his empowering presence and favor. He made us right in his sight and gave us confidence. What? We will actually inherit eternal life. We will. We'll get a new body and a brand new residence forever. Wow. Jesus is the most inclusive way. He's the most exclusive way. We don't have to be good enough or do enough good. But I want you to know when you get this revelation, and many of you have it. I know. I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak. People say to me, well, die then. Don't people, like, that's just a license to sin. You know, doesn't matter how good, doesn't matter how bad. It's like, first of all, did you know you don't need a license to sin? Most of us are doing pretty good without it, okay? Well, we are. No, when you get this revelation of who Jesus is, what he's done, the way he's inviting you into, you are so motivated to what? To follow him. To follow him. You are. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Well, but let's address the, just the whole thing. How do we know he is the way? Okay? I've told you why he's such an amazing way. And I am very aware this is a huge debate right now in our culture. In conversations I've been in, blogs I've read, you know, all these well-known Christians, like, deconstructing their faith and, yeah, there's a lot of confusion. There really is. And it's, it's sobering. It's very sobering. Many people are leaving the Christian faith. They are. Some are embracing new ways, whether it's universalism or new age. But they're, they're, some just, yeah, no, just me, you know, my way. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, I had a divine encounter. I was really, I was preparing for this message, but wow, I, I, I was shocked that how the Holy Spirit orchestrated this. So let me tell you, I was having a conversation. I ran into a woman I hadn't seen for a number of years, quite a few years, actually. And she and I had once been very close. She'd moved, she's in a different town, and uh, so I hadn't seen her, but um, we had been fairly close. I had discipled her. She had traveled with me. Like, we had a close relationship. And then she went through a very difficult divorce, you know, which is so traumatic, and lots of disappointing church experiences, which, again, I'm sorry, that's been a lot of our experience, this bad church experiences. And then, you know, life just kind of imploded. And if you've ever been in that place, you know what happens is you begin to question your faith. Like, wow. Is Jesus really the way? You know, like, is, is he really the, the, the son of God who died and, you know, took my sins and rose again and, you know, uh, the whole bit? Like, is he really the way? And she said, you know, I just begin to deconstruct my faith. And let me just say this. Most of you sitting here aren't deconstructing your faith, but you know a lot of people who are, or maybe you've been tempted to. I deconstruct my faith about once a month. That just means I take apart the constructs that no longer work or that the Holy Spirit has given me fresh insight, but I don't just deconstruct and let it go with that. You must reconstruct, which is why being in a church family and, you know, concerning continuing to grow in the Holy Spirit is so important. So I don't ever, I'm not scared by people deconstructing. I'm not like put off by that. I, I actually would rather you like question, which is what my friend began to do. And she just had this gut level honesty of, ah, Jesus, are you really the way? Are you the truth? You're going to have to show me. And, and she said, I had tons of conversations with people that she really admires, and they were going down the all paths lead to God. So she started investigating that. 
And she had this incredible perseverance because she kept saying, I want to know truth. I need to know truth. And, and it was not a pleasant experience at all. And, you know, she shared, you know, more details and, and all. That's actually not important. Um, but one night, she had a very vivid dream. Oh, I just love how Jesus does this. Had a very vivid dream. And in the dream, she saw this massive display of all, like, deities, spiritual guides. I was like, all these, yeah, gods, so to speak. And they're all, like, she said, I didn't know names. You know, I mean, I saw, like, Buddha and Vishnu. I don't even know who these people are. And she said, I didn't actually know all their names, but I was aware they were powerful gods, real. And the guides, like, quite a display. She said, breathtaking. And I sensed, as I looked at all of them, that I was being invited to ask questions. And so she said, well, I, okay, like, what am I, what am I going to say when all of a sudden she heard coming out of her mouth, well, what do you all think of Jesus? And immediately, as the name of Jesus crossed her lips, every deity, no matter how magnificent, how great, how small, fell on their face. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. And that sealed the decision for her. And she's been following him ever since. You know what? She says, Di, I so wanted to understand, be in control, have all the answers. And I go, no, no, no. You can never demand understanding because with faith, it's faith first, and then you understand. And sometimes you never understand, but faith so pleases God. When you choose to believe him, you choose. She said, now, like I'm reading the Bible with fresh eyes. You know, I'm not doubting anymore. I don't understand at all. No, that's fine. You don't have to understand at all. But she, I said, she said, I've chosen to follow Jesus. Well, that reminded me. As she told me that whole story, kind of brought me back to Julie's message about, you know, just this incredible truth of our God became one of us. Just, just died our death, took our sin, you know, made us new, gave us his spirit. And I remembered, you know, how beautifully that is captured in a hymn that is recorded in the book of Philippians. Again, the Apostle Paul penned this, and it's, it's quite popular. I just want to read it as we get ready to go into worship. Talking about Jesus, he said, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on the cross. There's a theme here. Humbled himself. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. As we worship today, I invite the Holy Spirit to bring a fresh revelation. Jesus is the way. He's an inclusive way. All may come. He's exclusive. He excludes all of our good and all of our bad. And he invites us to a flourishing life now and forever. So, Father... I thank you for the opportunity now just to declare your lordship, your goodness. Thank you for your mercy in our lives. Thank you for your grace. Thank you. And may we not wear it as a proud uh, label, but instead, Lord, humbly share the good news wherever we go about what an amazing king and savior you are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So we welcome the worship team. They're here. So let's, <laughs> let's let every knee bow and every tongue confess. Yeah.